Hello and welcome to this first podcast from the Norwegian edition of Le Monde Diplomatique. My name is George Miller, and my guest in this programme is Daniel Finn, who's contributed an article to the December issue of the paper on the collusion that took place between loyalist paramilitaries and the British state during the Troubles in Northern Ireland. Fifty years on from the start of the Troubles, the picture of that collusion is still incomplete, the narrative still contested. British governments once denied collusion took place, then moved on to downplaying its extent. But the fact of it is beyond doubt. Take the case of Patrick Finucane, a lawyer who'd acted for prominent members of the IRA, who was murdered in his home in North Belfast by the loyalist paramilitary group, the Ulster Defence Association, in February 1989. Earlier government reports ascertained that collusion had taken place, but had put limited information in the public domain. Then, in 2012, Sir Desmond de Silva was tasked with producing a public account of the involvement of the Army, the Royal Ulster Constabulary, MI5, and any other UK government body in the murder. Quoting from the summary of his findings, de Silva was left in significant doubt as to whether Patrick Finucane would have been murdered by the UDA had it not been for the different strands of involvement by elements of the state. Furthermore, there was a series of positive actions by employees of the state that actively furthered and facilitated his murder. And, in the aftermath, there was a relentless attempt to defeat the ends of justice. Unquote. Daniel Finn, who's deputy editor of New Left Review, has also written a political history of the IRA. So when we spoke recently, I began by suggesting that he must be familiar with seeking information that is hard to access. There are definitely issues there. There's questions about sources for telling the history of what was a, an illegal clandestine organisation, um, which for obvious reasons can't conduct its private deliberations in the way that a political party, a legal political party would do, or for that matter, in the way that a government would do. It's interesting to compare it with, you know, for example, the British government or the Irish government, where in addition to public discussions, interviews, documents and so on that a government will produce at the time, everyone knows that there are private discussions at the cabinet or between particular groups of ministers, which are kept out of the public eye, but are usually recorded in some fashion. And then in Britain, under the 30-year rule, which is uh, soon going to be changed to a 20-year rule, uh, those papers are made available to researchers or to the general public. So you can have a better sense of what was being said at the time. Now, there are limitations on that, for example, and this is something that comes up in relation to the Northern Ireland, in particular, papers being held back on grounds of national security. So we don't have access to the full documentary record of what the British government was saying and doing behind closed doors. But there is quite an extensive paper trail there that, for obvious reasons, doesn't apply to the IRA. From what we know, the IRA did keep records, minutes and so on, uh, of what was being said behind closed doors at meetings of its army council or its army convention. But there's no 30-year rule for the IRA. Uh, there's no kind of established, regularised procedure for making uh, that kind of documentation uh, available to researchers. And it's unlikely that there, there ever will be. So that's one of the one of the significant challenges in trying to um, to figure out what was actually going on at the time. And in terms of substantiating the collusion which took place during the Troubles between the British state and loyalist paramilitaries, has that been a long, drawn-out process of going from, from what is a, a widely held belief to something that can actually be firmly substantiated? Very, very much so. And it is that question of documentation and, and proof that would be accepted in a court of law or for that matter in the court of public opinion that's the most significant factor of what's been happening in the last 20 years because it's not that this idea of collusion between loyalist paramilitaries and the state dropped out of the sky from the late 90s while the conflict was ongoing in the 1970s and the 1980s it was something that was routinely said by nationalists and it was dismissed by the British government as IRA propaganda, but it was by no means only supporters of Sinn Féin or the IRA 
who made this accusation, nationalist politicians who were themselves strong opponents of the IRA, strong opponents of the Republican military campaign, accused the British security forces of colluding with loyalist paramilitaries. And that collusion could take different forms. You know, it, it didn't have to mean active support. In certain circumstances, it could be enough to look away at a particular time, acts of omission rather than acts of commission. And this was something that was said by people in nationalist communities, particularly rural nationalist communities and small towns in places like Tyrone and Fermanagh, that they noticed a distinct pattern where a loyalist assassination had been carried out in the area. It was routine to have security force checkpoints, but they noticed the checkpoint disappear just before or just after the attack so that the um, the loyalists were able to move in and out of the area uh, without being interfered with. So that was the perception among nationalists. But what has really changed over the last 20 years is that sources who could not be dismissed as being slanted or as being dupes of the IRA have come to that conclusion and have presented an abundance of evidence. Uh, in particular, various institutions set up by the British state itself. So, for example, you have the historical inquiries team of the PSNI. The PSNI is the Police Service of Northern Ireland, which was the, the successor to the Royal Ulster Constabulary. And they set up the, the HET, as it was known, to investigate cold cases, including IRA cold cases, where um, no one had ever been charged or prosecuted for, for a particular bombing or shooting. But they also investigated some of their own predecessor, the REC, some of its own record and drew some very damning conclusions, for example, about the record of the REC uh, in the mid-1970s. Other inquiries that were set up on an ad hoc basis, because there's never been an overarching Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission as there was in, in South Africa. Truth yes. Recovery has been a more fragmented ad hoc process. But there have been a number of inquiries into particular deaths, the most notorious of which was uh, the assassination of Pat Finucane in, in 1989. Finucane was a high profile lawyer who had represented IRA suspects. He was deeply unpopular with the security forces. He was a hate figure for the security forces. They accused him of being a, a patsy for the IRA. And he was assassinated by loyalist paramilitaries in his home in 1989 on a tangential point one one of the witnesses to to the assassination was was his son who was just recently elected as Westminster MP for North Belfast in in the election that was just held when people began investigating this assassination in a serious way virtually the entire UDA uh, loyalist hit team that carried out the the, the murder of Finucane was composed of government agents they were working for different branches of the security forces army intelligence or UC special branch and so on. And it really opened up a window into the much wider issue of collusion because there was a long running inquiry by Sir John Stevens, who again is one of those figures who can't be dismissed as a nationalist propagandist because he went on to be the head of the Metropolitan Police in London, very much a, an establishment figure in, in, in the world of British policing. His first experience of investigating Finucane's murder was telling because he had an investigation room in Castlereagh Barracks in Northern Ireland, an REC barracks, which was the most heavily guarded place probably in, in the whole of the United Kingdom. And yet a mysterious fire broke out, which destroyed the room and much of the evidence they had collected thus far. So Stevens carried on with his investigation and um, he learned a lesson about about where to keep his documentation that he had collected. And he drew some, some damning conclusions. To this day, We've only seen a very small portion of the material that Stevens collected. He, he published a partial report based on his findings, which, which had some very damning things to say about the security forces. Stevens reportedly collected over a hundred tons of documentation about the issue of, of collusion and about all the, the various strands that came out of the Finucane case, which is not being made publicly available. It's, it's actually stored on an army base in, in Britain. He got the, the RAF to transport it by military plane because that was the only safe way to move it. So there have been those investigations, other investigations by the police ombudsman. And now it's less a question of coming up with new new material. There still is a lot of new material that, that might come to light, but it's more a case of synthesizing all the information that we already have and putting it together into a cohesive narrative uh, about the issue of collusion, which really has to rewrite the whole history of the conflict in Northern Ireland, because the, the, the line that was put across by the British government 
and its supporters during the conflict, and which is still the line which I would say is, is dominant in the British media, for example, presented the British state as a neutral party in the conflict, it presented it as a conflict between loyalists and nationalists, between Protestants and Catholics, an ethnic civil war in which the British state was trying to play the role of neutral arbiter, trying to contain terrorism, trying to protect the public and uphold the rule of law. And when you look at the, the evidence around collusion with, with the loyalist paramilitaries, that view is no longer sustainable, if it ever was sustainable. There's no question that the British state took a different attitude towards the loyalist paramilitaries than it did towards the IRA. The attitude towards the IRA was that this group is a deadly enemy, an adversary that has to be defeated. The attitude to the loyalists was quite different. It, it varied. At different times, they might see the loyalists as a nuisance that would have to be contained, or they might see them as a potentially useful ally that could be deployed against the IRA and against the Republican movement. And that really torpedoes the claim of the British state to have to have played this kind of impartial peacekeeping role. Because the loyalist paramilitaries, their campaign of violence is much less known and, and reported on and understood than the IRA campaign. But because they were so remorseless in attacking civilians and, and in particular national civilians, they were responsible for about 50% of all the civilians killed in the conflict. And it's not credible in any way to present the British state as some kind of neutral party, neutral arbiter, uh, when they had this intimate collaboration over the space of several decades uh, with the loyalist paramilitaries. Some of the um, the language that was used at the time, which you quote in your piece, is really quite shocking. So the IRA are, p- are portrayed as a sort of deadly organised army, whereas loyalist paramilitaries are sort of on occasion almost dismissed as, as simply showing an excess of enthusiasm. They're just a little bit too enthusiastic in their, you know, in their their loyalty. And that, you know, that you quote something which a judge said at a at a trial describing people who'd been involved in killing as misguided, uh, but above all, unfortunate. Yeah, that that is one of the most um, one of the most striking, one of the most shocking examples because that relates to the case of the so-called Glenan Gang, uh, which was one of the most notorious loyalist groups at that time. Uh, it was based in mid Ulster and it was implicated in as many as a as hundred murders, including some of the most notorious atrocities of the time. For example, uh, the bombings in Dublin and Monaghan in 1974 that claimed lives of 33 civilians, bombs that were set off in rush air traffic with no warning, the massacre of the Miami show band and many other killings. And the Glenan gang did not simply benefit from the security forces turning a blind eye. It contained members of the security forces, both the RUC and the Ulster Defence Regiment, the locally recruited yeah. regiment of the British Army. Some of those RUC officers who were involved in the Glenan gang were eventually put on trial because they were implicated in a bomb attack on a Catholic pub. And as you say, the judge, Lord Lowry, who at the time was the most eminent judge in Northern Ireland, came very close to condoning what they had done. He presented it as an excessive but understandable reaction to the violence of the IRA. And the only one um, of, of the defendants who, who received anything more than a suspended sentence at that time was an RUC officer who had already been convicted of murder. But the others were effectively let off with a slap on the wrist. And when you have those kind of public signals having been sent out at the time, in this case by the judicial arm of the state rather than the executive arm of the state, that loyalist violence really wasn't considered to be a serious an issue. Other public signals that were sent out, for example, the UDA, the larger a loyalist group, the Ulster Defence Association, was a legal group until 1992. It wasn't until 1992 yes. that the British government finally banned it. And they justified this on the claim that it wasn't actually the UDA that was involved in a campaign of violence. It was an element within the UDA, um, which was completely false because the, the UDA had a, a flag of convenience called the Ulster Freedom Fighters. That was the name under which they claimed um, sectarian murders of nationalist civilians. But when their prisoners had been put on trial and convicted and were sent to prison, there was no Ulster Freedom Fighter wing. There was only a UDA wing in, in the prison. And that was completely transparent all through the 1970s, the 1980s. The, the UFF, the Ulster Freedom Fighters, was just a code name for the UDA itself. But it wasn't until 1992 that they were finally banned. And this issue, you know, as, as you said there, there was an attempt by 
British government officials, uh, the British Army, people in, in the civil service to downplay the loyalists by presenting them as something quite different from the UDA or, or the IRA rather, as not being disciplined, structured organisations like the IRA with a clear chain of command and the capacity to order attacks. They presented them as a more amorphous, almost spontaneous reaction on the part of some Protestants to the IRA campaign. In the 1970s, the RUC would refer to the sectarian killings by, by loyalist groups as motiveless murders, even though the, the, the UDA were perfectly candid in public about the rationale behind their assassinations. They said, as far as we're concerned, the entire nationalist community is complicit in the IRA campaign and we are going to kill Catholic civilians until the IRA stops its campaign. You know, it was, it was the idea of collective punishment. So it may have been a, a horrifying motive, but it, it, it certainly was false to describe it as, as motiveless murders, but that was ignored by the security forces. Now, it is true that for much of the 1980s, the loyalist groups were much less effective than the IRA. Their killings slowed down to a trickle. They still were killing people, but on, on a much smaller scale than, than they had been in the mid-1970s. And this is where the case in particular of, of Brian Nelson comes into play, because Brian Nelson was a man who had been a member of the UDA and was then recruited by a secret unit of British Army Intelligence called the FRU, the Force Research Unit, and sent into the UDA once more to become an agent for them. And he very quickly rose through the ranks of the UDA. He became their director of intelligence. Uh, when Nelson's role was exposed because of his involvement in the murder of Pat the Finucane, the initial claim by uh, the British Army, the British security forces, was that he had been sent in to disrupt and undermine the UDA from within and that he had provided vital intelligence that had saved dozens of lives. And that was the defence put forward at his trial in 1992. And as a result, he, he re received a, a greatly reduced sentence. It quickly became clear that that defence of N Nelson's role was a tissue of lies. In fact, there was very little evidence of him having prevented any attacks or protected anyone's lives. What he had in fact done was to reorganise the UDA's intelligence to make it much more effective. Because when he took over, he found that they had an abundance of material that had been passed on to them by sympathetic members of the RUC and the UDR, uh, but it was chaotic, it was un unsorted, much of it was inaccurate or out of date. So he passed on those files to his handlers from the FRU and they sorted it into some kind of coherent shape for him. They pruned the inaccurate information and updated the files using the latest intelligence. So the UDA's capacity for targeting people improved drastically while Nelson was in charge, and that was no coincidence. Another crucial part that Nelson played was in obtaining weapons for the loyalist paramilitaries, because he went to South Africa in the mid-1980s to negotiate with the apartheid regime to ask if they could import weapons for the loyalist groups. And they agreed, in principle, the first attempt to bring in the weapons had to be aborted because they they, they lacked sufficient funds. Uh, but a second attempt at the very end of 1987 uh, was successful. A huge cache of weapons, automatic rifles, machine guns, pistols, ammunition, fragmentation gr grenades was brought in and it was divided between the three main loyalist groups, the UDA, the Ulster Volunteer Force and another group called Ulster Resistance that was set up with the involvement of, of senior politicians from the DUP, the Democratic Unionist Party, which is the, the dominant unionist party today. And over the years that followed into the mid-1990s, those weapons were used in dozens of attacks. Attacks where, for example, a particularly notorious attack where members of the UDA went into a betting shop in Belfast, in a Catholic area, and machine gunned uh, the people in there. Attacks where they went into a, an, an isolated rural pub where people were watching Ireland pay in a, in a World Cup game in 1994 and massacred the patrons, including a man in his 80s who was the oldest victim of the Troubles. So the capacity of those loyalist groups to launch a, a greatly increased uh, and more effective and more lethal campaign of violence in, in the early 1990s was facilitated by the weapons which they had obtained thanks to Brian Nelson, a British government agent, who operated in that sense with the full complicity and knowledge of his handlers. Uh, when, when Nelson went to South Africa for the first time in 1985, his handlers actually paid for his plane tickets. Not only did they know what he, what he was doing, but they actively enabled it.
Daniel, you write in your piece that the battle over historical memory has become a story in its own right. And I wondered, perhaps in conclusion, could you say something about whether that battle has become more charged, more polarised in the current climate where there's so many questions about Ireland post-Brexit? That's definitely the case. And this is going to be one of the most um, ominous fault lines over the years to come because there's been a, a drastic shift in the role and the perceived role of the British government over the last few years, which I don't think has been widely appreciated by people in Britain. The, the Good Friday Agreement and the peace process relied on an image of the British government as being more or less impartial between nationalists and unionists. And when Tony Blair was, was the British Prime Minister, to some extent, that idea of the British state as being neutral, it was a polite fiction because the British state always had interests, for example, in relation to, to truth recovery and the issue of collusion. And you could see that during the Blair years. But certainly there was a perception that Blair was more or less even handed between nationalist parties and unionist parties in the nitty gritty of the peace process. You know, there was no perception that he was actively supporting um, the unionists in opposition to, to the nationalists over particular issues. Now, that perception in the last few years has been comprehensively junked. First of all, David Cameron, when he was the Conservative leader, formed an electoral alliance with the Ulster Unionist Party. Then when Theresa May lost her parliamentary majority, after the election in 2017, she was reliant on support from the DUP, um, the Democratic Unionist Party. And now, under Boris Johnson, an even more crude partisanship has taken effect because one of the items that was read out yesterday in the Queen's speech for the new government, its legislative agenda, was a ban on what they called vexatious prosecutions of British soldiers for historic crimes. And the Sun newspaper announcing this uh, new policy during the week helpfully illustrated it with a picture of the Bloody Sunday Massacre in Derry in 1972. So that's what they mean when they talk about vexatious prosecutions. They mean any prosecutions, including a case where 14 people were gunned down, civilians were gunned down in cold blood, in plain sight, in a case where even the British government has acknowledged that they were unlawfully killed. So that that kind of attitude uh, on the part of, of the Tories, it's not so much because they, they actively want to support the, the DUP or the Unionist side in Northern Ireland. It's more about giving red meat to their own base. It's about promoting yes. British nationalism on the home front, on what they would consider to be the mainland. But it has very obvious implications for Northern Ireland. So this this is going to be one of the most difficult things to handle. And I would, would be really concerned about what is going to happen next with this, what is now a very, a very belligerent, hard right Tory nationalist government, a government that revels in, in flying the flag and which has moved away from, you know, this is one of the factors that made it easier to conclude the Good Friday Agreement in, in the late 90s, that Tony Blair's government was moving towards a somewhat softer and more inclusive form of British nationalism. It wasn't just Northern Ireland. There was the devolution settlement for the whole of the United Kingdom. There were regional assemblies being set up for Wales and for Scotland. And so Blair's government was trying to promote the idea that you could be British and you could be Scottish or you could be British and you could be Welsh or you could even be living in Northern Ireland and not consider yourself to be British at all and your identity would be respected and there wasn't too much of a, you know, an in-your-face state-led form of nationalism um, telling people that they had to be one thing and not the other. And that's really gone out the window. You know, it's not just in relation to, to the north of Ireland, but even in relation to Scotland, where on the one hand, Nicola Sturgeon's government has said that they want to call uh, an independence referendum in light of new developments since since uh, the Brexit referendum of 2016. But Johnson's government is quite openly saying, uh, under no circumstance will we allow that to happen. It doesn't matter how many people in Scotland want a referendum. It doesn't matter if the Scottish Assembly votes overwhelmingly to hold a referendum. Uh, we will stop it from happening. And you could quite plausibly see in the next two or three years a scenario somewhat like what happened in Catalonia when the regional yes. government there pressed ahead with an independence referendum in defiance of the central government. Given the kind of uh, chauvinistic rhetoric and, and quite authoritarian rhetoric that has become mainstream for the Tory party, I wouldn't rule that out by any means. So that would have implications not only for Scotland, but also for its near neighbour, Northern Ireland. And it's something that has to be you know, kept very much in mind over the coming years.
I was talking to Daniel Finn about collusion between the British state and loyalist paramilitaries in Northern Ireland. You can read Daniel's article in the December 2019 edition of Le Monde Diplomatique, which is out now to our subscribers and also available on newsstands across Norway and Denmark. Subscribers can access it and the complete archive of the paper online at www.lmd.no. If you're not yet a subscriber, there's plenty of open access content online to entice you to become one, and full details on how to go about it. In the words of the late John Berger, why read LMD? To make sense of what's happening in the world behind the misinformation. I hope you'll join me again soon for another interview with one of our contributors. Until then, thank you very much for listening, and goodbye. 